and we're into the final uh, session, and we're ending on the highest of notes, we really are, um, with our keynote address from someone who is, without question, one of the most influential creative leaders uh, in the country. Uh, Kwame started out his career uh, path as an actor, but we remember, uh, including in Casualty, uh, and then went on to even bigger um, and even better things as an acclaimed uh, playwright uh, and as director. He ran the Baltimore Centre Stage Theatre from 2011 to 2017, before returning to the UK, of course, to take the role of artistic director at the Young Vic, the very first Afro-Caribbean person to, lay, to lead a major British theatre. Well, listen, during that time, uh, Kwame has transformed the Young Vic, stunning new work and bold reimaginings uh, of the classics. Um, now, Kwame recently announced that this would be his last, regrettably, uh, season at the Young Vic, but he'll leave behind a truly exceptional Kwame artistic legacy, and indeed an important cultural legacy as well. Every bit is important. Across the 40 productions staged during his tenure, more than half of the play's writers and directors have been women. Black and global majority artists have directed over half and written almost half of the Young Vic's uh, main house shows. And offstage, the Young Vic has been equally transformed from 11% to 44% black and global majority staff across the organization and 40% uh, in senior management. A remarkable achievement indeed, uh, Kwame. As someone who is without question uh, a restless, creative spirit, a risk taker, a storyteller, a mold breaker, a change maker, as we're about to see someone exceptionally smartly dressed. <laughs> we really couldn't have anyone more apt uh, to finish our festival uh, today and deliver our finale on courage with the queen of the day. So please join me in welcoming to the stage the brilliant Kwame Kweama. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, it takes courage to come on this stage directly after those brilliant women. Um, so uh, I want to thank them also for talking about the arts in a most profound and brilliant way. And I want to thank you for that beautiful introduction. Uh, my children are listening, or at least I recorded it so that they can. Um, <laughs> get some brownie points a bit later on um, and and thank you all for being here I actually like to start things like this you know I, I'm an African kind of guy I believe in call and response and so I kind of want to just kind of get a little vibes and know who's in the room so I wonder if you could do me a favor uh, on the count of three just shout your name out all at the same time one two three Kwame <laughs> All right, I heard of Susan, Brian, <laughs> Ade. <laughs> um, all right, good. And then I'd like you to do one other thing, actually, uh, for me. Now, I'm going to give you about 10 seconds to think about this. I want you to think about um, a poem, a line from a poem, a line from the, the lyrics of, of a song or even from a play, but something that really made the difference in your life. That moment when hearing those words saved you, helped you, allowed you to help someone else, defined you. I want you to take 10 seconds to think about that line, that couplet, that lyric. I'm keeping explaining to extend your 10 seconds. <laughs> And when you've, when you've got that, um, just, just raise your hand gently so that I, I know that you're good. I see some hands. That's great. That's great. That's great. That's great. That's great. Fantastic. All right, on the count of three, I want you to scream it into the air. <laughs> we good? One, two, three. <laughs> Fight. 
the power. You've got to fight the power that be. Great. Do we have a microphone? Yeah, great. Uh, can I have one, please? Thank you. OK, this is the point where all the camera people say, what's wrong with this guy? <laughs> all right, uh, did you put your hand up, sir? Yeah, good. Tell me what it was. A journey of a 1,000 miles begins with one single step. Beautiful. Who said that? I believe it's Confucius. Very good. We'll have some of that. Who else put there? Let me go, yeah, to you, Matt. Red, thank you. I don't know who wrote it, but it was in my grandmother's table um, as a poem. And, and the, the core, well, the, it ends with, ere I forget all the joy that is mine today. Mm. Never forget all the joy that is mine today. I'm going to do two more. I'm going to go down a few rows. And I'm just going to go, the people who don't want, they're looking away. They're like going, <laughs> don't come near me. I'm not interested in this thought experiment. <laughs> I'm going to go to you. Did you put your hand up? You but did it. I then I think you're still going to have to now, right? <laughs> okay, it's not really a poem, but the thing I can think of is um, a quote from Khalil Gibran, which is, uh, "Your pain is the breaking of the uh, wait. Your pain is break the breaking of the shell that encapsulates your understanding." Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you. And I'm going to go over there for the last one. So again, look away if you don't want me to come by you. And then, no, no, leave that there. That's, thank you. And I deliberately will. I can see you looking down, ma'am. So I'm going to keep, I'm just because just I'm a nice guy, I'm going to keep going forward. But I think whoever sat next to you, I'm going to ask. <laughs> so that later, I've just caused some confusion. There we go. Uh, life can be a daring adventure, or it can be nothing at all. Oh, who's that? Helen Keller. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, everyone, for being um, so bold as to share that. Oh, let me give this mic back. I've got one, haven't I? Okay, just so greedy. Okay, thank you. Um, that's important for me. Mine is I was about 20, how old I? 24, and uh, the rap band Public Enemy um, kind of burst into the scene about 1988, and it was really dangerous and subversive to even listen to them. At least that's what I thought. And then by about 1991, they let out this song called Fight the Power. You've got to fight the power that be. And I can remember where I was when I heard that. I can remember what effect it had on me. And many, many years later, sometimes I've had to realize that I am the power and that people will be fighting me. And that really... Um, that really helped me when I started to think about why I do what I do and where I am right now. And I am in the legacy business. It's no longer about me. Thank you for reading my beautiful CV. But in a kind of way, you can add things to it, but I've kind of done what I've done, right? Now you get to a certain age and you start thinking about what can I do for those who come behind me? What pride do I have when I see a brilliant member of staff that I've promoted and they fly, and then you promote again and they fly, and then they leave you and you get really upset that they've left you. <laughs> but you see them in their new job flying. There's something beautiful about legacy. And uh, in a way that underpins everything that I'm, I'm going to say today. And, and I also want to thank Andy and the RSA because I, I'm, I was really excited to see this word courage be the catalyst for today's meeting, for today's festival. It's so positive. It demands action. It demands thought. It demands that you think about yourself in relation to it. So I just want to thank you again for bringing that into my life today. I'm, I'm overjoyed to kind of just be here because this place is dedicated to new ideas, big ideas, desperately needed ideas. It'd be fair to say that we here in the UK are an understated nation. Um, some might say a historical gunboat diplomacy nation. So today's theme of courage is kind of wonderful because, well, to operate and lead in the arts today, it takes courage. And I take my hat off to everyone that does it. Actually, you do it so well. Possibly too well for your own good, but I'm going to come back to that. The headlines in this week's Economist reads, Britain 
where the arts at their best still dazzle the world, but must decide how much it wants to invest to remain a magnet for artistic innovation and performance. How many people in this room would define themselves as an arts leader or an arts practitioner? Okay, great, good. I would say a nice minority. How many here frequent the arts? Amen. So the context of that headline, of course, was that we know, you know there have been central government cuts since austerity was introduced. In the 1997 to 2010, Labour government spent generously on the arts, but in 2010, ACE's budget was slashed by 30%, which meant for my sector, theatre, we were at standing funding for 13 years. Yes, 13 years, 12 of them before the cost of living crisis. I want you to say, for example, I have a budget at the moment that I'm working on for a production, and we did this budget in October. We revisited it last week. And I'm just talking basic materials, no additions. And it's gone up by over 30%. Today, to budget in our sector takes courage. Lord Bragg recently warned of cultural vandalism, referencing the moving of money out of the rich southern subsidized sector and out into the rest of the country. But what I fear most is the funding situation we are in right now, right across the country. And it is diminishing the very thing that we are speaking of today, courage. Actually, I want to push a little further than that. I would argue that the funding situation has created an atmosphere of fear, and fear erodes confidence. Fear contracts the imagination. Fear attacks ambition. And what diminished ambition denies most importantly or most perniciously is opportunity. The emerging and mid-career artists in this country in theatre are asking existential questions of themselves and of us. They're saying, how can I exist in a sector that for the foreseeable future will not be in a position to employ me, to invest in me? And their ultimate fear is that this stagnation is personal to them. It, is, it feels like if it's only there to support the status quo, those who by lottery of birth are able to make it through. And now that they have, up comes the drawbridge. This, I believe, underpins some of the toxic exchanges we've witnessed on social media in the arts over the last five years at least. What does that do for those of us who believe in legacy? What does it do for those of us who feel that the only reason we are here is to make sure that tomorrow is defined well? What this fear, or as my executive director Lucy Davis calls, the narrowing, ultimately does, is to ask us leaders themselves to be complicit in the undermining of their own sector to perpetuate and bake in unsustainable profit or loss models that run contrary to the founding principles of the not-for-profit subsidized sector. I quote a fearless leader of the early American not-for-profit theatre movement, Zelda Fitchhandler. She said, we make a choice to produce our plays not to recoup an investment, but to recoup some corner of the universe for our understanding and enlargement. We must create something different, something of value, something our government and our patrons can embrace with love and humor. Jenny Lee, arts minister in Harold Wilson's government, stated in a 1964 white paper, A Policy for the Arts, that the arts had to be valued as highly as any other industry that it was crucial that the population had equality of access to arts wherever they lived, that new ventures needed to be supported as much as established institutions, and that participation of all was essential. She wasn't wrong, was she? What's really interesting is that in real terms, the pound has lost 96% of its value since 1964. 
Our position in the league table of industrial nations has tumbled. Our superpower in Britain is not our traditional industrial might, our ownership of big tech or platform capitalism. Our superpower is our creativity. Anyone in the room disagree with me? Our artistic might opens doors for our business people across the world and attracts millions to our shores, not just in tourist pounds, but in investment pounds. If, as the latest McKinsey report has laid out, that for every pound invested in the arts, almost 150 goes back into the local economy, and that the creative sector is the fastest growing sector in the country. If we believe this to be true, and most people like to believe what McKinsey said, our investment in the arts is an investment in our industrial capacity, something that should be deeply embedded in our fifth industrial revolution strategy. Therefore, we must have the courage to invest sustainably in our arts and our artists. Now again, as Andy said, I, I've just resigned from the best job I've ever had in my life. And I did that the day that I woke and I realized that the act of creating a long-term, not even actually a short-term, sustainable business model in this economic environment, which is a continual act of creating all wine and water, um, that, that I was being complicit in the undermining of the very privilege I walked the world with, the privilege of British creativity. For background, I inherited a wonderful, brilliant theater. And like many cultural institutions, it had a structural deficit due mainly to standstill funding. To balance the books, we moved from three stages to one. No space to counter program. Innovation, access, and high box office income, all from one stage. Yet again, as Andy said, in six years, we were able to move our staff from box office to senior management, from 11% black and global majority to 44%, making our theater reflect its environment, London. We transferred place to the West End and Broadway, created an original online streaming platform that had our work seen in 86 countries. Our community department innovated its work in local schools and took its mission to the US and Australia. We produced plays written by AI and continued during the pandemic and beyond servicing 2,500 emerging and mid-career artists with workshops every week. Wine and water, my friends. But even that, she's looking in the rearview mirror, and that's quite boring to me. I hadn't even begun my third act at the Young Vic, and that's of kind of three acts, not five. Um, with the support of my brilliant board, we had planned to start a capital campaign to convert one of our spaces into a live music, sports, and arts venue, build an AI XR studio for the current generation of multidisciplinary artists and the virtual exploitation of our productions, build a multi-nation production that shared cast and resources. I am neither tired nor was I fired. We are projected to make a surplus this year and next. I have the energy and the ideas to move into another leadership position if I so wish, but I am a working class black man. It was not perceivable but six years ago when I took over at the Young Vic that a black male, one of the most disinvested demographics in theater, would lead a, a major London venue. I said at the top, I believe in legacy, yes, so I cannot and I will not draw the bridge up after me. Not in a sector designed to nurture, to include, to innovate. Now, this is not a Young Vic problem, but a sector problem. Relying on the generosity of US-styled philanthropy, creating even more complex and unsustainable income streams, it unfairly taxes leadership and it creates fear. The fear that I've been refer referencing. It diminishes courage. Our sector can kind of afford to lose people at my end. We'll simply move into the commercial sector of theater, television, and film, both here and internationally. But it's so short-sighted of our nation to pull the rug from beneath the next generation, chomping at the bits to take us to the next level of innovation and success. 
So whichever government is in power at the end of the year, I simply ask you to have the courage to have a big idea. A straightforward, unremarkable, but fair idea. One that funds the arts sustainably. Stop worrying about us being compared to the collection of refuge or under-resourced social service department and understand that we are an integral part of the social and business services of this country. Our economic contribution alone far exceeds our current level of investment. I say again, we must invest sustainably in our nation's creative power. This is not arts for art's sake, but part of a plan to replenish our national coffers, to sustain our global position as a creative, artistic superpower. We must have the courage to do this. And we, the practitioners of the arts, must have the courage to demand this, not just of our government, but of we, the citizens, that elect them. Sometimes we might have to do that with our feet. I hope that no other leader has to leave their beloved post because the future does not look like it's one where we can invest in legacy. Thank you so much. I did tell you it was going to be brilliant, didn't I? Um, uh, Kwame, that was amazing. Um, we've got 20 minutes. I'm going to save my question till the end and go to the audience straight away, because I know there's going to be so many thoughts, questions, reflections uh, from the audience. We'll start here. Um, Thank you. That was a, a life-changing speech. and. I wondered what makes fear the kernel of courage? Hmm, hmm, that's a nice question. Well, let, let, let me frame it this way, that um, I'm afraid of fear. I really am, which means that every time I see it, I have to run directly at it. And I have to run directly at it because if I allow it to defeat me, I will live under a rock. And I was trying to work it out the other day why it happened and, and forgive a little bit more of biography, but I grew up in the 1980s where white youth culture defined itself through the lens of skinhead right-wing politics. And it meant that I lived in an area called Southall, and it was, I'm going to call that the donut, because everywhere around Southall was just surrounded by extreme right-wingers. And, and, and I had to travel seven miles to school every day. And it meant that I left the safety of my bubble, and then I had to go through racist area upon racist area upon racist area. And every day was a dance with death. Every day I looked at another black person who got onto my bus and I went, and I went, <laughs> yeah, meaning, I got you, I got you, I've got my eyes for you. And I think what that did for me was, was make sure that, that if I, I loved school, by the way, and I loved going to school. So it meant I either had to bend to fear or fight it in order to be fed. I don't necessarily call that courage. I call it survival. And so is fear the kernel of courage? I don't know. But what fear is, is something that we must rebuke. What fear is, is something we must negotiate with. And if from that comes courage, then so be it. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, mate, thank you. That was fantastic. Um, we're currently in our business looking at the whole issue of succession planning. And I'm working with my successor. What quality does your successor need that you don't possess? Hmm. Again, a really brilliant question. Uh, and, and actually, I, I've, I've danced with this a little bit. The moment that you, uh, you kind of go, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to transition out, 
You then think, I really hope the next person's shit so that I look really good. <laughs> And then, and, and, and then you can't grip it yourself. That lasts about four seconds. And then you start thinking about legacy. And then you think, oh, I want them to have all of the things that I don't have. I love being a leader. I don't love managing. I do it. I want someone who comes in next, I'd hope that they love managing, because that's really good for staff. Um, I hope that whoever comes in next um, doesn't feel like I feel, which is even though I've run institutions on three continents for the last 15 years, I still fundamentally feel like a freelancer. And, uh, and I hope that whoever comes in next doesn't have that in the way that I do as something that weighs on their shoulder, that feels guilty about feeling that. But I also feel that whoever comes in next, that I, I don't even want them to know that I existed in some way. I just want them to be them. I want, the only thing I ask of them is before you throw me under the bus, and you should, be it publicly or privately, just call me to say, Kwame, I'm about to throw you under the bus to the Because, right? <laughs> you know, that bit, thing that you did there was really crap, and I'm going to do it differently. And I'll be like, cool. And I've done that at Baltimore Center. This is exactly what I said to my predecessor. Uh, I said to her, uh, to my successor, rather. I said to her, again, I know you're going to have to throw me under the bus, just call me. And she did. And there were times when she sat in the room, she said, what Kwame did, I disagree with, and it was wrong. And I'm going to do it my way. And then a board member might call me up and go, do you know that she really dissed you? And I was a bit like, cool. <laughs> so uh, I, I, whoever comes in should not be a version of me, but a full version of themselves. Beautiful. Where should we go next in the room? Over here. Thank you. Uh, that was amazing. My youngest son is in his penultimate year at drama school. He is so excited about the future and the potential and particularly how you bring something like motion capture into a theatre setting. So he's just sparking with ideas. And the careers advice he's being given is just calm down. And I'm kind of curious about that. And I wonder what advice would you give to someone in his position to, you talked about legacy, to have a sustainable future because this is where his heart is. There are, there are, there are three responses that I have to that. First of all, um, I have four children and two, well actually three are, are in the arts. Um, so I'm gonna be working forever. Um, <laughs> So in terms of sustainability, have a really good pension. Have a really good, um, uh, you know, whoever told him to calm down, um, I, I'd, I'd love to have their email address so that I could, I could send them a really, you know, tough email because it is that ingenuity that I'm talking about. This generation, unlike my generation, who grew up thinking that you only had to do one thing for the rest of your life. I used to hide the other things I did in a, in a bushel so that people wouldn't know. They have grown up to be, to, to call themselves anti-disciplinary, not even disciplinary. They'll wake up today and say, guess what, I'm going to do a podcast and wake up tomorrow and go, I'm going to make a movie and wake up the next day and I'm going to do stop motion. And, and actually that's all part of their portfolio because they have to do it because the world has changed. So I would say to your son, well done. Know that that will give you the edge. Thinking about technology and access is not even today, it's yesterday. So whoever thinks that they should not be are simply in another world. I, we did a play three years ago um, written by AI. And the reason we did a play written by AI is because I got afraid of it. And as usual, <laughs> If I'm afraid of it, I've got to run at it. And, and what we did is we put the, uh, you know, we prompted the AI to write this play, but I put three brilliant playwrights in the room and five actors and a director. And the whole idea of that, and actually day one, the piece in AI was really bad. And by the end of the run, uh, it was pretty good. And, uh, but actually I went, we as human beings are gonna have to find a way to dance with it, to tame it. To, to enhance it. So I say again that the, that the way that your son is thinking is the tool that will make him successful or will sustain him 
when times are bad and funds are low. Now we have Tim at the front. Oh. Thanks, uh, Kwame, that was incredible. You talked about being a black man. You also talked about being a working class man. And I wondered, I was gonna talk about the fear of poverty, of taking the risk of going into something like acting, but it probably wasn't a fear. It was, poverty probably wasn't a fear. It was probably a reality, right? Uh, you know, struggling financially. But, so I wondered, you know, how we encourage more working class people into acting, but also how we encourage more working class people to embrace arts like opera or ballet or classical music where they're given the message, this is not really for people like us. Yeah, and I think it's a Jedi mind trick, <laughs> right? Because no one says, guess what? You're working class, I'm not gonna take your taxes. <laughs> right? Everything is ours. And I often say to my children, I keep calling them children, they're grown now, but you know, that, that walk into every room and assume equality. But the moment someone challenges your equality, revert to superiority. <laughs> Everything is yours. Yeah. There, I, I remember the first time I was taken to the opera, I, I was quaking. I was so afraid. And, and, and I was so afraid because everybody else in that opera house kind of knew Don Giovanni and I didn't. And I felt intellectually inferior. And then, by the fifth time I saw Don Giovanni, I realized that it was for me. It was a story of, of fathers and sons. It was a, a, a story that was just told with a technique that was different to, to listening to Stevie Wonder, but with the same passion. And so it's important for us as, and you know, people go, yeah, Kwame, sure you're working class. So I like to describe myself as of working class heritage, if indeed, if we need to, to pass that. Um, but it's so important that we walk into every space and own it. Because if we don't, that invisible lion, that invisible <gasps> policeman or woman that stops you from mentoring is only projected by you. Of course the system says, I don't want you in here. But we have to usurp that. That's what I would say. Okay, that's right. Hi, a little controversial question, which yeah. is, um, I understand why you've resigned, um, the reasons you've given today, but if I said, put it to you, well, maybe you should stay in the system because you can't change the system unless you're in it, so that you can fight for all those things that you believe in, what would your answer be to that? I, I would say that's not controversial, but thank you for asking that. <laughs> I, 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 I believe that, uh, and of course I negotiated with that with myself before I came to that decision. And I think what, what fear does, it creates fight or flight. And I think, because of the position that I'm in, I can do both. I can continue, even if I'm in the commercial sector, to fight for the rights of, of the difference between the subsidized sector and the commercial sector. Mm -hmm. That I can continue to advocate from a position of whatever power I may have. I'm not running away. I'm simply saying at this moment and at this time, it is untenable. And what I'm not gonna do is be complicit. It's like sometimes, you know, I'm an African Caribbean. And there were moments when through our enslavement, we could look 200 years that way and 250 years that way and only see enslavement. And sometimes you might find resistance is futile. Why? And other times there were people who got up and said, you know what, I'm not gonna take this anymore. And that's the decision that I have come to. The decision is that I have a profile enough to say, if we do not invest sustainably in our subsidized arts sector, you will lose people like me, but most importantly, you will annihilate the generation to come. Are you happy with that?
question, uh, one down the front here and perhaps one at the end as well. Can I actually see? Thank you for that. Um, so um, when are you going to become Secretary of State for Culture? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what is the first thing you're going to do when you are? <laughs> Uh, I, I think that's a really hard question because whatever I say, politicians go, no, 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 I don't want that at all. And, and, and actually, I don't. And, and I'll tell you why. Um, because uh, I, I use my art to be my politics. And I believe um, in burying my politic like spinach right at the bottom <laughs> and letting people discover it. And then when they discover it, then they dance with it if you've got the art right. And I think the art of being a politician is telling you what you want to hear. That runs contrary to a playwright who wants to tell you the thing that you didn't. Wonderful. I hope that answered that. You're not sure? Come, come. Oh. Good. Question there, a the, couple of questions, I think, maybe in the corner. Uh, thank you. Um, Ed Matthews Gentle. I'm strategic lead for culture and creative industries in Lancashire. Um, you've, you've spoken about your kind of um, bravery, I guess, this one, and your kind of fight. Can you say that one more time? You've spoken about? About your, your, about your response to fear. Okay, great. Yeah, but a slight nuanced question on that. Um, because a career in the arts and creative industries, it takes a, lo a lot of bravery. It can be a very precarious endeavour um, as well. And one of the things at some stage that happens is that you're in a situation where you can say no for the first time. And I think that's a real pivotal time for a creative to kind of say no, to turn down that brief, you know, to sort of, you know, to say no, I'm not going to do this, this isn't the right thing. And that's quite a key moment. And I was, I was curious to understand what is it within you that actually kind of made you sort of, you know, can get up one day and decide no, no more, not this. You know, and were the words, were the, was there someone who sort of, or, or moments that you remember when you had to make that sort of choice yourself? And, and going back to today's theme about courage, where did you find that courage? Hmm. Well, thank you for that. And, and I think I, I, I'll reference that I don't know that I define it as courage. I define it as an action. And, uh, and, and if I may just really quickly, I, I, I've done this before. Uh, I was negotiating a, a new contract. It was really lovely when I was in Casualty. And, uh, and, and that night, and we would shoot Casualty 200 miles away uh, in Bristol. Love Bristol, if anybody's on that. And, and, um, and, and that night, I called my son. And my son, we've always had a really wonderful relationship. And, and, and he was being really rude. He was about 12 and really dysfunctional. And, going, and then he said, Dad, what do you know? You don't know me. And I went, oh, shit. And the next morning, even though I was really looking forward to the money I was going to make with my new contract, I, uh, I called the executive producers and I said, uh, I've got to go. I've got to be at home for my son. When I was in Baltimore, I came to London and, um, and Rada was producing uh, my very first play. It was called A Bitter Herb. And I'd written it maybe 15 years before, maybe 12 years before. And I'm the kind of mind that once I've written something, I've forgotten it. I don't know anything. And they invited me, so I came. And I was really frightened. And I went, oh my god, I'm going to go in, and I'm going to see this junior playwright. And I'm going to see all his mistakes. And I thought I was really good at the time. And oh my god, it's going to read. And I went to see the play. And I realized that I was braver then as a new playwright than I was as an AD. And that if I didn't move away from the comfort of being an AD, of trying to please people, I would never be that artist again. And so I walked back into Baltimore the next day after we had done a capital campaign and we had raised the theater and the theater was in my image. And I said to the chair, I've got to go. So my restless spirit tells me. And then my mind tries to engage in the complexities of what it means to move at that moment. It would be vain of me to call it courage. What it is, is trying to listen to the spirit and trying to be true to the gift that I've been given 
which is to be an artist. And to be an artist is to excavate the cracks that are placed before us and reflect them back. You've got to have the tools to do that. And when there are not the tools, I get busy. Now, we're running short. I write with time for one or two more questions. Uh, so we'll take one down here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's more. Oh, I do beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, it's a reflection, not a question. I just wanted to say that I've, I kind of spent most of the day uh, debating with myself what the cause of courage was and what the requirement of courage was, and to some extent, therefore, what the opposite of courage was. And I think what you've shown this afternoon is that the sister of courage is integrity, and you have so much of that, and I hear so much of that in what you're saying, and I just want to thank you for that. God bless you. Bless you. Would anyone like the last question to Kwame before I steal it? It's not a question, really. Um, I'm 60 on Tuesday. <laughs> and I joked on Facebook before I came today um, that I was going to be here with people, um, you know, the worthy and the good, and that's what I'd like to be when I grow up, because <laughs> I haven't quite grown up. Um, but I notice I started out in acting and then abandoned it because I didn't have courage. <laughs> because I was seven and a half stone and I was too fat and, you know, I had an RP accent and it wasn't interesting then. Um, in the 80s, and I went into mental health. Um, and that was a time when asylums were still full of legacy patients mm. who were there because they were gay, because they'd had babies out of wedlock, um, because we had this terrible unofficial term called West Indian psychosis then. Yes. I know it well. We have come so far, you know, and maybe that's the legacy of my generation, but I had a little break and I went and did history for a while and I just wish I could be around in 50 years' time to see what happens next. Thank you. Thank you. Kwame, we're, we're approaching the end, uh, uh, and um, I'm going to steal the last question from myself, as I, as I mentioned. Um, just sensing the mood in the room, I think we are all buyers investors in Kwame's mesmerizing vision of how things could be. So I suppose my question to you, Kwame, is how can we, we as the RSA, we as fellows and friends, how can we help you make good on your vision? Well, well thank you. I, the first thing I would say is that I think it is our vision because I don't think there's anyone in the room from reading the room that, um, that believes that our superpower is not our creativity. And I think we have to be bold with that. I think we have to stop allowing ourselves to be pushed into corners and come out loud and proud, not make apologies and go, I know there's not enough money in the coffers. There is enough money for the bankers. When we want money, there's money. There's enough money for all stuff. And then we start going, um, but we can't do this. We can, we can have a big idea. And that's what everybody in this room can do. They can help form a big idea. They can help put pressure on our politicians to have a big idea to fund our arts sustainably. And I think we can all do that. Let's, let's let our local politicians know that the arts matter that it's not something that should be snuck into the manifesto, but something that they could p even possibly lead with. Everybody wants to be cool. Nothing's cooler than the arts. <laughs> <laughs>